Hello, and welcome to the first global single flywheel shooter tutorial. Today we're going to talk about this shooter device. Here's an example of what the shooter can do when it's complete. In front of me, you'll see all the pieces that you're going to need to build the shooter. The first piece we're going to talk about is the extrusion. In your kit, you have 420 millimeter extrusion, 225 millimeter extrusion, and a few pieces of angle cut at 45 degree extrusion. For our purposes, I've gone and set up all of the pieces that we're going to need to build this assembly. On the build materials, you're going to see all of the pieces you need in order to build. Here, on this extrusion, you can see that I've marked with X's the pieces that are going to be removed from the extrusion. The other parts are going to be the pieces that we keep. It's important to note that when you're cutting, you'll lose a bit of material. So prepare and put that in when you're doing all of your calculations. Here's a screenshot of the bill of materials. Take a second to look through it. Feel free to take your own screenshot so that you can look at it and follow along while we build. Next we have some drawings that show what the plastic will look like and what each of the pieces of the metal extrusion are going to be from your base kit of parts. Take a second to look through these and again, feel free to take a screenshot so that you can use them as you follow along. In order to prepare the extrusion, you're going to need to use the following tools. The first item is a half saw. This is what you'll use to actually cut the extrusion. It's important to note that when you're cutting, you're going to lose a small amount of material, so build that into your calculations. The second piece you will need is a C-clamp. This is what you'll use to take your piece of extrusion and clamp it down into the table while you cut. The final item that you'll need to use is a file. This will be used for deburring or taking away the sharp pieces of metal after cutting the extrusion. The next thing that you'll need to do in order to set up all the pieces that you'll need is to prepare the plastic pieces. Again, I've gone ahead and done this for us. The important parts here are, make sure that when you're using a box cutter, you always cut away from you. If you were to cut towards yourself, you could end up slipping and cutting in. To start off, you're going to need two pieces of 27.7 centimeter long extrusion and one piece of 6.4 centimeter long extrusion as well as two inside corner brackets. You will start by sliding the inside corner brackets on to the longer pieces of extrusion and then on to the shorter pieces of extrusion. Here you can see this process sped up. This is what the final result should look like after you've completed this step. Next, you're going to grab the 90 degree motor bracket. You'll notice that we only have four screws in here and two on each of the outer sides. This is important because if you install the middle screws, it will affect the mounting of the motor itself. Again, here you can see the process sped up. We will then mount the motor into the motor bracket. You can note that there are many different orientations that this can be done. However, it is important that you mount it in the bottom inside corner. Once you've aligned the motor, the holes in the top of the bracket should align with the holes in the motor and you can screw it into place. Once again, here it is sped up. With the motor mounted, this is what the result should look like. Once you're done, you're going to take 125 tooth gear and mount it onto the shaft, followed by a shaft collar. The shaft collar will make sure that the 125 tooth gear does not slip when the motor is spinning. For our next axle assembly, we have four different shaft collars, two of the metal bearing blocks, three of the 3mm spacers, two of the 1.5mm spacers, a 30 tooth gear, a 125 tooth gear, and a 135mm shaft. To begin this assembly, you'll take one of the shaft collars and put it on the very end of the axle, and then tighten it down as follows. The next piece we'll make use of is the bearing block. You'll notice here that one side has a little lip to it. This is the side that we'll want to attach the screws to. The other side has no lip. Here we'll see that the screw bolt heads are attached on the side with the lip. This is going to be important for alignment. Next we'll slide the lip side onto the axle. We'll slide it all the way down until it hits the collar. Then we'll take a 1.5 millimeter spacer and slide that on as well. The next thing is we'll take another shaft collar, slide it onto the axle assembly. Here we'll make sure that the two pieces align 
before we tighten it down. Next we will take another bearing block assembly and slide it onto the shaft as well. Here we're going to note that we have the nuts on both the inside. This is going to be important as we slide the entire piece together. Next we'll take another one of the shaft collars and slide it on an assembly, making sure once again that everything is lined up. Then we will slide on a 3mm spacer. Then we'll slide on another 3mm spacer, followed by a 1.5mm spacer. Then we'll attach the gear. It can be difficult to put the gear on as it has a lot of friction. Keep pushing until it's generally onto the middle of the shaft, but don't feel the need to align everything right now. Now that we have that axle assembly done, we can take the entire piece again and slide the assembly on. Here you'll notice that we have the bearing blocks both on the inside portion. We'll slide that all the way down until the gears mesh and then tighten down the hex head bolts. Here you can see that process sped up. As you're aligning the gears, make sure that you keep the two pieces perfectly parallel with one another. You may slip a little bit, but this will be important as we reduce the friction on the shooter. Here we can look and see the final product we can see that the gears are meshed pretty tightly together. We can do a test by spinning the larger gear and seeing that the smaller one rotates. If for some reason we were locked up, we would undo the assembly and redo. Next we will slide on a 3mm spacer, followed by the 125 tooth gear. Once this is slid on, we will attach another shaft collar, making sure that everything is aligned. For the next assembly, we are going to need 5 shaft collars, two of the bearing block assemblies, one shooter wheel, one 30 tooth gear, three of the 3 millimeter spacers, one of the 1.5 millimeter spacers, and a 15 millimeter spacer. To start the assembly, we will take a shaft collar and make sure it is aligned with the base of the shaft. Then we will proceed to tighten it down. Next, we will take one of the bearing block assemblies and slide it on making sure that the lip is facing the outer part where the shaft collar is aligned. You'll see that no lip is on the inside piece. Following this, we will take a 1.5mm spacer and slide it onto the shaft. This will be followed by another shaft collar. Again, we will make sure that we have the two shaft collars lined up before tightening. Next, we will attach the actual shooter wheel. You'll notice that one side has a flush face and the other has a little bit of an indent. The flush face will slide all the way through until it makes contact. Then we will attach another one of the shaft collars. This one will be underneath the lip as you can see there. Next we will take another of the bearing block assemblies and slide it on. You'll notice here that sometimes the two pieces can come apart. When this happens, just pop the bearing block back in and slide it down. Next, we will take another one of the shaft collars and place it onto the device. Following this, we will slide on two of the 3mm spacers and slide it until it's flush. Then we will attach the 15mm spacer, followed by another 3mm spacer. Then we will attach the 30 tooth gear. At this point, we can take the assembly and slide it onto the overall piece. We will pay special attention to make sure that everything is lined up correctly. Once we make sure that everything is lined up and that the bearings aren't slipping, we will tighten down the final free collar. Once we have everything aligned and the collar tightened, we will pinch with our finger the 30 tooth gear to the 125 tooth gear, making sure that everything stays parallel. Then we will take and screw down the final pieces. Sometimes we will have to move between the parts of the wheel in order to tighten everything down. Again, we can test our final system by making sure that everything spins freely. We can do this by either spinning the wheel or by carefully spinning the middle gear. Again, if the system were locked up, we would take this final assembly apart and try to reattach more cleanly. Then we will tighten down the final shaft collar, making sure the assembly is secure. For the next part of the assembly, we will need to take two of the 8.4 cm pieces and two inside corner brackets. We will slide the inside corner bracket onto the piece and then onto the same side of the channel as the gears are mounted. 
For one piece, the part closer to the motor, we will completely tighten down the piece of extrusion and the bracket. For the one closer to the wheel side, we will only tighten down the piece of the bracket that is attached to the 8.4 centimeter piece, thus allowing it to freely move inside of the channel. For the next part of the assembly, we will have two lap brackets and two of the 9.8 centimeter pieces of extrusion. First, we will take each of the lap brackets and attach it to the base of the pieces of extrusion. These two attachments should be opposite of one another so that they mirror when they get put on. We will slide one of them onto the front of the assembly. The lap bracket should sit just behind and we can tighten this down. In order to attach a future piece, we will now need to slide three of the bolts onto the base between the piece of lap bracket and the next one that will go on. Now, if you forget this or forget another one in the future, there is a way around this problem. If you do run into this problem, in your kit of parts there are these things called T-slotted screws. These can be slid into the channel even once there is no way to slide them on onto the ends. You'll notice later in this assembly that I forgot a few of the screw heads to put in early on. I could solve this problem with the T-slot or I can do what I did. However, if you're performing the process, I will indicate where ahead of time you can slide in some bolts to save yourself a lot of time. Now that we've attached the extra bolt heads that we will need for the future, we can take the final piece of the lap bracket and slide it on to the other end, making sure to tighten it down so that it is flush with the side of the wheel. For the next step, we will take the 8 cm by 9 cm piece of plastic and line it up with the parts of extrusion that are near the wheel. We will take a sharpie and mark on it four points near each of the four corners where we can poke a hole so that we can attach this piece of plastic to the extrusion with screws. To actually set up the holes, we will use a small screwdriver. We will put the tip at the point where we've marked with a sharpie and then slowly rotate the screwdriver until we've managed to poke a hole all the way through the piece of plastic. Once we do this, we will take our box cutter and cut around the head of the screwdriver. This will make sure that we cut off any of the residual plastic that we've poked where the hole used to be. We can repeat this process for each of the other four screw holes. Next, we can take four of the bolts and slide them into the holes that we've just created. Then, we can take the entire assembly and slide it onto the piece of extrusion, making sure that we don't touch the wheel. Then, we can attach the nuts and tighten everything down. For the next piece, we will need two of the 27.7 cm long pieces and four of the inside corner brackets. This will form the top of our shooter. At this point, we can indicate the extra screws that you will want to attach in order to alleviate the problems that I encountered in the future. In addition to the two screws that you can see me sliding into the top part of this channel here, we will need to slide in two screws to each of the four upright pillars. Now, these screws will be placed on the inside channel. In this shot, you can see two of these pillars, which are facing away from me and towards the view of the camera. Once you've added these additional screws, you can then tighten down the top part of the assembly. However, if you've done this before adding the screws, you will note now that there is no way to slide regular screws onto the top parts of these two pillars. If you do need to do this, you can do so with the T-slotted screws that we mentioned before. Once this side is completed, we can now attach the top part for the other side. On this one, I actually missed an additional screw. So, while we will have two screws on each of those upright pillars, we will also need to install one screw between the two corner brackets. This is between my two hands right now. Again, if you forget to add the screw here, it won't be a major problem. We can fix this later on. It will just take a lot more time and effort than it will right now. Once you've attached all of the necessary screws, we can tighten everything down with the exception 
of that one middle pillar. This one should be allowed to slide, though it may be difficult for it to move. Once again, here you can see the entire tightening process sped up. Feel free to change the speed of your player so that you can follow along with each bolt and screw that I tighten. If not, feel free to tighten the entire assembly minus that one pillar down. For the next part of the assembly, we will need to take the 7.8 cm piece of extrusion and two of the inside corner brackets. We will slide the inside corner brackets on, make sure they are flush with the edges of the 7.8 cm extrusion, and tighten down. Then we will take the entire assembly and mount it onto the top portion of the shooter. For the next portion of the assembly, we will take the weirdly shaped piece of plastic that is roughly 10.5 cm by 6.5 cm. This will mount to the two bolts that we have on the long side, as well as one bolt on the inside portion of the top piece. We will slide on an additional bolt and then align these parts of the plastic so that they slide onto the bolts. This process can be quite time consuming. I suggest using a small Allen wrench to adjust the positions of the screws so that they all line up. Once the parts are firmly pressed together, you may need to cut a part of the plastic away using the box cutter. With the plastic piece attached, we can attach the nuts, but don't tighten them down as we will need this assembly plus that one center pillar to be able to move so that we can set it up later. For the next part of the assembly, we will need the two 10.9 cm pieces of extrusion as well as four lap brackets. We will tighten down one lap bracket so that it is flush with one end of the extrusion. We will then set these into the channels made on the top of the shooter. Then we will attach the second lap bracket so that this slides into the extrusion nicely. With this done, we will duplicate it for a second piece of extrusion. The first piece of extrusion will be tightened down at the end of the shooter that is opposite the motor. The second piece of extrusion will be slid freely so that it matches the same orientation as the first one from the front of the shooter back. Here you can see that process sped up. At this point we will take one of the small game pieces and stick it between the piece of plastic and the last piece of metal extrusion that we recently added. We want this ball to be able to slide in pretty easily. We will make sure that the plastic lines up as well as the extrusion. This may involve shifting the center post that mounts the bottom piece of plastic. At this point, we can tighten everything down, including the vertical post that we used to allow to move freely. When you are done with this step, there shouldn't be anything that is allowed to freely move. For the next part of the assembly, we will be attaching the last two pieces of plastic. The long piece of plastic will mount on the side that is closer to the wheel and further from the gears. This is where I spend a lot of time fixing the problem of not adding enough screws. You can either solve this problem like I did, or if you've added the screws ahead of time like I suggest earlier in this video, you can skip ahead to the next section. However. If you don't want to follow either of these two solutions, again, you may try to use a T-slotted screw solution. Here is the entire process sped up.
Next, we're going to begin the assembly of the trigger for the shooter. We'll start by taking the servo bracket and mounting the servo to it. The exact mounting of the servo is important, so follow along with the video and make sure both the face that the bracket is attached to, as well as the orientation of the servo, is matched exactly. Once the servo is attached, we will next need to attach the shaft adapter. This is a small piece of black plastic. With this attached, we will now be able to stick the shaft into the servo so that it can rotate the shaft effectively. Once the shaft is attached, we will take a shaft collar and slide it all the way down to the base of the shaft. Then, we will slide on one of the 60 tooth gears. At this point, we need to make sure that the servo is firmly attached to the shaft because we will be doing some testing with the programmer on the actual system. With the servo firmly attached to the bracket, we can now slide the entire apparatus into the extrusion on the shooter. You'll notice that we have a hole here in the plastic. Next, we will take the SRS programmer, which is used to control how the servo interacts. We will use this device to program the servo so that it fits our desired needs. First, we will need to switch the entire system on. Then, we will attach the PWM cable, noting that the white cable should be on the side that says continuous. Making sure that the switch is placed in the S position, if we press the test button twice, we will see that the servo begins to rotate. With this done, you can slide the entire lever arm as it currently exists off of the shooter apparatus. Then, you can take two of the longer bolts and slide them into the 60 tooth gear as shown. With this done, you'll take the piece of corner cut extrusion and slide it onto the bolt heads. If the corner cut extrusion does not slide on easily, or can't slide on at all, then you've probably set the extrusion and the bolt heads at the wrong position. We will tighten down this part of the lever arm using two of the nuts. With this form of the lever arm, you should see how it is attached with the two bolts tightly tied down. Also, you'll see that the edge or the corner is very much flush with the edge of the wheel. Next, we will slot this back in to the overall shooter for more testing. Again, we can turn the SRS programmer on. If we press the test button once, we'll see the thing swing out the entire angle. If we press it again, and then continue to press each of the buttons, we will see the left, right, and center positions currently programmed for the lever arm. At this point, we can note that the lever arm is on the outside portion of the gear. What we would prefer is that the lever arm be on the inside portion. So at this point, we will disassemble and reassemble on the other side. At this point, we will set a left limit so that the lever arm does not push into the plastic but gets very close. In order to do this, we will enter the programming mode on the SRS controller. To do this, we turn the programmer on and don't touch any buttons. We will then manually move the lever arm to the point where it just barely touches the plastic. Then we will push down the left button once. Once the LED flashes, we will then press and hold down the program button until we see the LEDs flash, meaning it has been fully programmed. With the lever arm fully programmed, we will now attach the next 60 tooth gear. We will slide this onto the axle and loosen the other side so that we can add both sets of tall bolts. At this point, with the lever arm firmly attached to both 60 tooth gears, we will slide on an additional shaft collar as well as the through bore bearing long, followed by the bearing pillow block. Then, 
the short bore bearing small. With the full assembly of the trigger arm done, we will slide both the bottom bracket as well as the pillow block into the assembly on the shooter. Next, we will take one of the small game pieces and put it into the chamber. With this done, we will check that our lever arm hits roughly the middle of the ball. If this is true, we will tighten down both of the shaft collars so they sit both above and below the individual 60 tooth gears, not allowing it to move. For the next phase, you will need four of the 22.5 centimeter pieces of extrusion, the two corner brackets, two lap brackets, a 90 degree bracket, and a four centimeter piece of extrusion. We will attach the two corner brackets to the base of the 22.5 centimeter extrusion. Then we will slide them onto the back mounted extrusion piece on the top of the shooter, taking special care to make sure that the pieces are centered and that the two corner brackets are touching one another. This will be important for keeping the ball inside the shooter. Next, we will take the two lap brackets and attach them to the base of the other 22.5 centimeter pieces of extrusion. This should be done so that they look like mirror images of one another. We will then slide these onto the inside part of the second piece of extrusion mounted to the top of our shooter. Again, we will take care to make sure that these pieces are centered before tightening down. We will test that this hopper for the shooter works successfully by taking one of the small balls and dropping it through the chute. Here, in this example, we'll notice that the ball can't make it all the way through into the bottom part where the shooter is triggered. If this is the case for you, you will loosen the front piece of the extrusion we just mounted and slide the whole apparatus forward until the ball fits snugly but slides easily. At this point, you will notice that if the trigger is pulled back, the ball can fall out the back of the shooter. In order to rectify this issue, we will take the 90 degree bracket and the 4 centimeter piece of extrusion. We will slide the 90 degree bracket onto the back mounted piece at the top of the shooter. Then, we will attach the 4 centimeter piece of extrusion to the base part. Now, when the ball is dropped, it will be stopped by this small 4 centimeter piece of extrusion and remain in the hopper until the trigger pushes it towards the wheel. In order to mount the shooter to a drive base, we will take the variable angle bracket and slide it onto those three screws that we left available to ourselves early on in the build. For now, we will allow this bracket to slide freely as we will need to adjust when we mount. The next phase is we will take each of the 150 degree brackets and slide them onto the inside bottom parts of extrusion. These will be screwed down tightly making sure that the extrusion exactly hits the peak of each of the brackets. These will be used to mount the shooter at this express 60 degree angle. If you want to have a higher angle, you can modify yours with one of the custom angle brackets or two of the custom angle brackets that you have in your kit. In order to finish the entire assembly, we will next need the 19.1 centimeter piece of extrusion and the two 6.5 centimeter pieces of extrusion. Here, I'm mounting the entire shooter to the chain drive base that is documented by Rev. If you haven't already built your own drive base, or built this drive base, you can find documentation on how to build the chain drive base on the FIRST Global website. The piece that used to hold the front battery plate can be removed, and then you can slide on six of the inside corner brackets. You may need to attach these with T-screws in order to finish the assembly. Next, you'll slide the two pieces of 6.5 centimeter extrusion onto the back portion and the one 19.1 centimeter piece of extrusion onto the front portion, making sure that the two pieces in the back 
are a certain distance apart so that they correctly match with the back of the shooter and that the front piece of extrusion perfectly aligns with one of the two back pieces. Next, you will insert the entire shooter. At this point, you make sure that the front adjustable bracket mounts correctly into the 19.1 centimeter piece of extrusion and then tighten everything down. Here we can see that the collar and the piece of extrusion are very close together. We want to make sure that the wheel spins freely. If it does, we're done. If not, we may need to adjust the front piece of the assembly. The final step in the hardware design is to take everything and wire it together. For this, we will need three different wires, a motor wire, an encoder wire, and a PWM wire. First, we will take the motor wire and connect it to the base of the front motor for the shooter. Then, attach it to port 2 of the control hub. The next thing we'll do is take the encoder wire, which has four prongs, and attach it to the encoder mounting of the front motor, and then to the same port 2 of the control hub. Finally, we will take the three colored PWM cable and connect it to the servo wire, making sure that the two white cables align. Then, we will plug it into port 0 on the servos for the control hub. This completes the hardware build for the assembly. Next, you will see some video of the autonomous behavior and a discussion of the code. Here's a video of what the robot can do. We can first initiate the active shooter wheel by pressing X on the control panel. We'll notice here that we take a shot and that it scores. We'll mark that with B. Then we'll move forward while still being able to see the target. Then we can press A to initiate the autonomous mode. Then the robot will orient itself move to the right X direction. Once this is complete, it will look at the target and back up until it reads the right Y direction. Once it's done this, it will adjust its angle one more time if necessary, and then begin to shoot autonomously. Here, we can see that the robot autonomously makes four additional shots. When we want to terminate the autonomous mode, we hold down the right bumper until the robot stops firing or moving. Then we're back to the teleop phase where we can initiate shooting with X, deactivate with Y, and use the right trigger to shoot. At this point, we will walk through what we are doing in the code. First, here's the beginning of your overall program. We've segmented a lot of the work into external functions, so we'll talk about those each individually. Here, you can see that we go through the process of initializing all of the variables. Then, we begin if the op mode is active. At this point, we call the Vephoria and activate it. This is the vision system that we use to make this shooter autonomous. Then we get into the main body of our program. Basically, the first few if statements here are allowing us to set up the storing of coordinate positions from a shooting point that we scored. When these values are set, we then can look at how we drive the robot. We set the power to the motor left and motor right using the left and right sticks. This will allow us to drive either the left or the right side forward or backwards, enable us to turn, and allow us to do position tracking. The next if statement relates to whether or not the shooter is actually shooting. If we hold down the X button, this will start the wheel to spin. The next if statement after this is Y. This one is set so that if we hold down Y and the shooter is shooting, we will turn off. Following this, we have the autonomous mode. If we are holding down A, we aren't in autonomous mode currently, we can see the target, and we're not at a Y distance of zero, meaning we're directly on the target, we will begin the autonomous mode. Before discussing this while loop, which entails all of the autonomous code, you can see at the bottom that we have our trigger button. This will allow us to initiate the trigger and launch a ball into the wheel so that it is shot. This is what happens when you pull the right trigger button down. In the main while loop that you see here, we go through all of the pieces for the autonomous shooting. First we check whether the shooter is shooting autonomously already. If so, we continue in that mode. However, if it isn't already shooting, we first track to the heading, meaning we line up with the target. Then we pause quickly, move the autonomous X distance, which is horizontal or parallel with the target, pause again, retract so that we're facing the target, pause again quickly, then move the Y distance. We then set the velocities to zero so the system isn't moving. 
pause quickly, track again so that we're facing the target, and then check that we are facing the target correctly and begin shooting. Then we have an if statement that allows us to terminate autonomous mode. If we are holding down the right bumper, we want to terminate this mode. We then turn the shooter wheel off, set the trigger positions so that it isn't engaging a ball, and update all of the necessary variables for autonomous mode to restart again in the future. At this point, we're going to dive into each of the functions that you saw in the code. These would be the purple blocks with names like initializations or pause quickly. In the initializations function, we set up all the beginning values for our system. Basically, this says we haven't chosen a spot from which we're shooting accurately, we haven't set an actual velocity, so the system shouldn't be running. We haven't set an X distance. We have no trigger set, and the motor speed is set to zero. There are some additional values here, including what we use to drive, what we use for the PIDF values, which you can look up in a separate guide, and the initializations for the Vuforia targeting system. All of these are vital for our setup. You can look at them individually with some of the resources that we have published on the FIRST Global website. If you have any questions, dive into those guides. The next guide that we'll talk about is the Print Vuforia Telemetry. This is what we use to actually print data to the console of your game system. When doing this, we'll see that we're updating the velocity, the world map and whether or not it's visible, the X, Y, and heading for each of the shooter as it currently is being read, and the X, Y, Z of any position that we have stored using the B button. This function is pretty simple, and it just updates each of the individual variables of interest, and then calls a telemetry update at the end to add all of that data to your screen each time. Now we will discuss the turn left 90 and turn right 90 functions. It is important to note that this is a really basic way of solving this problem. Here, we can see that we calculate an elapsed time of 1.65 seconds, and then we set the motor velocity to the same direction necessary to turn left or to turn right. When the time is up, we set these values again to zero. This only kind of works. One thing that you will notice if you use this system is that the 90 degree turn won't exactly be 90 degrees. It also may change with the level of battery that you have. When the battery is more charged, you may turn more than 90 degrees, whereas when the battery is dead, you may turn less than 90 degrees. This uses something called dead reckoning. While this may be a first attempt in order to solve the problem, you'll also note that it won't give you the exact response every time, and so a better way of doing autonomy should be thought of. In the autonomous shooting function, we first print the telemetry to know what we're actively shooting at relative to the target. We then set the velocity of the shooter to 1900. This is a value that I've calculated to give you the right height at a certain distance. However, if you change the angle, you may also need to change the velocity that you set things to. We then check what the actual velocity is and store that to our variable. Then, if the actual velocity is above a threshold, we allow the trigger to start initiating. We hold off for one second, release the trigger, and then initiate again. In this process, we have started autonomous shooting, allowing one second per shoot time. Then, we can set the shooting started to true for the additional behavior of our function. The pause quickly function is basically used to put a small, brief overlay into our code so that we can define different behavior modes between moving X, moving in Y, and tracking to the heading. This allows us to more easily diagnose problems that may arise. In the autonomous X distance function, we can see that we make use of many of the other functions that we've already talked about, including turn right 90 and turn left 90. Here, we also use drive-specific distance. This function, which we will talk about next, is another form of dead reckoning. However, what we will notice here, too, is that basically, we track on the x distance and check, are we above or below a certain limit around the point that we have set? If we are, we will record the distance we need to move in order to move into the correct direction. Then, we will turn right or left first, depending on which direction we are off. The drive-specific distance function also uses dead reckoning. This is the first type of autonomy most people will think of when they develop a system. Basically, we use a distance calculator to determine how much time we should run the motors for. 
This distance is calculated from the distance that we spit in from the target that we're reading. We then divide by a series of parameters. These parameters include the circumference of the wheel, the number of ticks per revolution, and the overall speed that we need to move. Basically, at this point, we put in an elapsed time from the time function that we've just declared and run our motors at that speed for that amount of time. This is not always going to be accurate. Like we said before, if the motors are spinning at this speed, they may actually be spinning at a different speed at a different battery level. However, this system should basically solve the problem. The reason I say basically here is that the problem can be more complex. When we move in the x direction, we may lose sight of the target, meaning that when we return, we may not be able to lock again. This can cause a huge problem in large-scale autonomy. A better way of thinking about this problem would be to find a solution that never involves us losing sight of the target, and therefore not using dead reckoning to move simply in the x and y directions. Now that we've talked a lot about dead reckoning, let's look at the autonomous y distance function. This function does not make use of dead reckoning. Instead, it shows some behavior that is better for large-scale autonomy. Here, we look at and determine whether we are too close or too far away from the target relative to the y position that we set. If this is true, and we can see the target, we will then either move closer or further away from the target until we hit our desired point. This is not dead reckoning because we are constantly using sensor input in order to determine the behavior of our system. Whereas in the dead reckoning case, what we were doing was taking one sensor reading, calculating a specific value to move, moving that value, and then looking at our sensor again. This system is much better than dead reckoning because it means we can look at sensor data more frequently and therefore respond more effectively and faster. The last function that we have to discuss is track to heading. This is what we use to align the shooter with the target. If you're missing too far to the left of the target, we will turn right, and if you're missing too far right of the target, we will turn left. This is what allows us to align when we need to shoot. This tutorial introduced you to many new concepts, including a better version of a shooter, basic autonomy, and how to use camera vision. However, this is only the start of what you'll need to do to build your 2019 competition bot. In order to be very successful, we suggest you look at the following changes. Can you think of a way to load your robot from the ground as opposed to having to hand load it? Can you figure out a way so that you don't have to turn away from the target during autonomy? There are a lot of other changes that you might be able to make, including better drivetrain bases, more accurate shooting, or even better autonomy. This is your challenge as you go forward into the 2019 competition. We wish you luck as you build and program your robots. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at First Global.